Hey everybody. Hi, welcome. Welcome to the surprise Saturday live uh, video today. We've had a heck of a time. Um, I'm Darcy from the Purposeful Pantry, in case you didn't know me. And today we're talking about dehydrating fails. We're going to have dehydrating Q&As. And maybe at some point during the video, I'm not going to tell you when, we might have a giveaway or two from my new book, Dehydrating Basics in Journal. So welcome to the video today. Um, We've had a really big fail at our house this week. I know a lot of you might have seen about it already on social media, but we had hatch chilies that we were dehydrating. My son loves hatch chilies. It's one of his favorite times of year. We can't grow them here. It's Texas. They're grown in New Mexico. They're hatch chilies for a reason because they are uh, grown in that soil that makes them just taste so unique. And so when you grow them anywhere else, they're not actually hatch chilies anymore. They're hatch chilies grown in your area, so they will change flavor. So... Um, this year I thought I'm going, I'm going to dehydrate all the ones that I can. I'm going to freeze some for him and, and then dehydrate those. And, um, I dehydrated them outside, which is where we always do chilies because I can't handle the smell inside. Uh, and so in bringing in my, uh, dehydrator into the house, I set it on the edge of the sink where I thought it was stable. Uh, got the camera set up because of course I'm going to video it because it's a new project that we haven't done on, on, on tape for you guys on tape. That's so old. I'm so old. Back in my day, we still used tape. Um, but in reaching for it to push it over to where it needed to go, I tipped it just to the side and it went. And I tried my best to catch whatever part of it I could. But because it's Nesco, it just can't part. It hit the ground. Hatch chilies went everywhere. I mean, literally everywhere. We still found one under my filing cabinet that's right here under my desk. Uh, and so um, it was not able to be saved because it's not like it was just a pile right here. It was everywhere. And because we've been preserving this week so much, I've been doing a ton of cooking. Um, I haven't been keeping the floor as clean as it should be because I've just been so busy with everything else that there was no way I was going to sweep up everything that was on the floor into that food. I couldn't have gotten it clean enough for storage. Um, now I might have gotten it clean enough to eat for dinner that night because I could have boiled it like to death, but you know, cat hair, human hair, dirt, uh, just whatever else. I just wasn't gonna take that chance. So it was so sad to see them go. But good news is that we went to the uh, store last night uh, and they happen to have still like a whole big display of hatch chili. So we've got them for a little while longer. So I grabbed as many as I could and brought them home and we'll be doing them again this week for him because that way he's happy. So that is our story of my dehydrating fail for the week. That happened to me, uh, and I'm sure it happens to you guys. So I want to talk through those with you, give you some tips, help you learn that every project that you do, even if it doesn't work out the way you think, is never a fail because you can learn something from it that will help you do better the next time. So let me get, uh, I can, just so you know what's going on here, I can see the screen to read it better up on the monitor as opposed to my laptop right here. Uh, so you may see me looking off, and that's where I'm looking forward to see your questions. So First of all, let me say hey to Creative Beauties. Hey, Wendy. Hey, Peggy. Sharon, uh, the Wicked Witch. Pamela, Chris, Louise. Uh, welcome to the chat. I hope I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm always so grateful that you guys come in and give information and ask questions and talk to each other. And we all learn together because I've learned so much from you guys. As much as I try to help you uh, get started on your journeys. So let's ask some questions and talk about dehydrating failures, just dehydrating failures. So what did I learn from mine? I learned to stop going so quickly that I don't do things well. Clean my floors more often when I'm in the middle of those big preservation times, not just when I'm doing regular maintenance, but spend some time cleaning that floor uh, and make sure it's clean for the next round of things. And just stop assuming that whatever I think it's going to be okay, it's not going to be okay. I'm going to drop it. I am klutz. Uh, and so I need to make sure that I put things in safe spaces, not where it's tottering and I don't notice. So that's something I learned from my mistake. Okay, let's let's go with some questions that we have here. Somebody's already asking. Okay, Peggy, thanks very much. I'm so glad you're liking the lives. I love doing them. They're just uh, not always, con well, I'm not going to say they're not always convenient. I just need to make time to do them more often. Okay, Sharon, uh, hatch chilies can be hot and they can be kind of mid range. It depends on what your taste is um, and how you handle heat. I don't find them particularly hot. 
if they're green, they are hotter than if they turn red as they get sweeter. So we have let the ones that we have um, get to the fully red stage. We let them get fully um, ripe before we did these. But this time I'm going to do half and half. I'm going to go ahead and preserve some of these right now and I'll let the rest of them go ahead and ripen up the rest of the way. And I was picking them both ways so that we could have both versions. Okay. Um, Wicked Wish which always ask my potatoes always dehydrate brown. They look sad and terrible. First, are you blanching them before you put them on to the dehydrator? That's a must. Either blanch them or soak them in a citric acid water bath. Um, that's what needs to happen because they need to have that done before you dehydrate them. That's usually why they turn brown. But also after you dry them for a while, if you have the heat up, uh, they can turn brown like the dice ones can, uh, like cubes can turn brown over time because the, the starches in them start to do that. They're not burned and they're going to be covered in whatever you do with them later. So it doesn't matter as much. And you can always turn the temperature down a little bit if yours tends to run a little hot. Okay. Well, Louise, I'm glad you're here that you caught alive today. Um, all right. Can I dehydrate dairy-free parfait. What's in the parfait, Creative Beauties? It depends on what's in it. Dairy-free means it's all sugar. Um, and is it dairy-free? Are you talking about like a vegan alternative or are you talking about fat-free dairy? Because those are two different things. If it's a vegan alternative, usually they have a lot of oil that replaces the dairy fats. And oils over time will turn rancid on the shelf. So it will depend on what the actual ingredients are in that before you think about drawing it. Okay. Well, Wicked Witch tips, that's what we're here for. If, if I don't have them, you'll see a lot of them in the chat. So make sure you're reading all the chat that people add their tips to. Okay. Let's see. Hey, Ann, glad to have you here. Hi, Helen. Hot and wet Louisiana. I'm sorry. You got our wet. Uh, we got it a couple days before you did, and it just drenched our area, except for our little neck of the DFW area. Um, there was quite a bit of the northern part of the county that I live in didn't get hardly anything. And then we had like places that were getting up to 15 inches, just uh, like 45 minutes away from us. It just, it just gave them so much. We are technically out of a drought now because of that rain that came. Um, and so we were in drought and in one day made up for the entire drought season. So the lakes are going to start filling back up as all the rain water uh, gets to them um, from all the rivers and creeks and stuff. But um but I'm sad you guys got it. It sounds like you guys got it more than we did. So, um, but we're looking forward to a little bit more because we hope that we're going to get some of that rain this time that we get a lot more than what we got. Um, let's see. Hey, Renee and hi, R.S. Dawson. Hey, Sally, how are you? Oh, I am so glad, Sally, that you got the dehydrators. I think that it's probably one of the best entry level ways of preserving other than freezing that there is. It's so easy and you can walk away from it. It doesn't mean that canning is not great or freeze drying if you have the ability to get a freeze dryer and do it. Um, but dehydrating is just so user friendly right off the bat. Uh, it just takes a little bit getting used to what you have to do to prepare for it. And I'm glad your granddaughter loves it. Hey, Kathy, how are you? Um, Wicked Witch, blanching potatoes usually needs to be about five or six minutes, and then you go straight into a water bath to stop them from overcooking. So try that again the next time you do it. Make sure that you're kind of getting that time right. Um, Kiki says it wasn't a fail, but she found that when she dehydrates garlic, the smell fills the smell fills the house, and there's a fine layer of garlic oil on everything in the house. It was weird. I'm surprised about the oil, but yeah, it's going to smell up your house, and it you can be one of those camps that you either really like it or you don't, and that may be one that you have to start doing outside. Um, peppers of all kinds have to go outside for me. Um, I have asthma, and so they can kick off my asthma sometimes and make it really hard for me, so we have to do those outside. Onions are outside because my husband hates the smell. Um, the boys would prefer if I put greens outside because they smell like funk, um, but they're never going to go outside. So you're going to learn that some of those things, if you have the ability to do it outside, do it outside. That's why I love my Nesco because I can throw it out in the backyard and I don't have to worry about it. It's great. All right. 
Um, Susan, if your lemons turn brown, there are a few reasons. They either were too hot in your dehydrator, which means you turn that temperature down. Uh, like I recommend in my tutorial and stuff, you need to keep the temperature much lower than what it suggested because those sugars in lemons and all other citrus can turn brown really easy. And then over time on the shelf, especially when they're exposed to light, they will turn dark. Uh, they don't lose their flavor. They're just darker because remember, um, moisture, light, heat, and oxygen are all the things that are bad for food storage. So with dehydrated foods, just like with uh, if you happen to do freeze dried foods or even for most dry foods, you want to store them in a dry, uh, cool, dark place. So those are the reasons why. So try them again and turn your temperature way down next time. Know that it takes longer, but you will have less of the darkening up front. Um, the lemons and limes that I still have left over from last year have all pretty much turned dark, turned dark because they are in the light. I can't, I have nowhere else to put them that's useful. Um, and so I noticed this morning when I was doing a quick clean, uh, they have all turned pretty dark and we're not into tea drinking season yet for uh, hot teas, which is when I use them most. So, but I'm going to still use them because they're still going to flavor my tea. So they're still good. They just don't look as pretty. Okay. Um, Marjorie says, oh, let me make sure I've caught up with everybody else. Sorry. Um, hey, Mary. No, you've not missed an announcement. You're here right on time. Um, okay. Marjorie says that her failure will be the worst one that I've read. So my failure is my unopened dehydrator. Um, it's not a failure, Marjorie. That's not a failure. Okay. But I'm going to encourage you get the thing out and throw some frozen vegetables on there. They are the easiest thing to do because they've already been prepared for you. They've been blanched. They've been cut. They are ready to go. You don't even have to thaw them. So do it, get them out, go buy some, if you have to go put some frozen vegetables on there, because even if they don't turn out something like you like, you can powder them, which is one way that failures don't always have to be a failure. If you don't like something, um, powder it and make it a powder that you can integrate into anything else that you do. Um, Marsha, um, Marsha's asking what kind of dehydrator that I would recommend. Now, I would love to say I will only recommend this one dehydrator because this one dehydrator will change your life. That's not the case. Um, I would like to say, yes, go buy an Excalibur because it's the best one out there. The fact is Excalibur is no longer the best dehydrator in the market, but it also may be something you can't afford or you don't have the space for because they're really large. So what I try to do is what your budget, how much space do you have to put it in and how much volume are you looking to actually do? So are you looking for snacks? Are you looking for playing around with it? Or are you looking at taking a large garden and trying to get it preserved and dehydrated for your pantry? That kind of plays into it. So um, there are all sorts of dehydrators. I'm going to put a link. Let me see if I can get to it really quickly for you. Um, hold on just a second. All right, so I stuck a link in the chat for you that is a link that I have that's a resource that kind of walks through all the sorts of dehydrators, the, the, the thing that you're looking for, like what to look for in one, and then breaks it down into budget. But a Kasori is a perfect small machine. It's six trays. It's got a relatively small footprint. It's very quiet, which is the biggest seller about it. It's very quiet. It's relatively inexpensive. Um, with I have a deal that I have with Kasori right now that you can get one for $128.99 USD. Um, they only ship into the US. Sorry about that. But that is a great first machine. It's the one that I you see me use in my videos all the time right now. Um, but there is a magic mill. There is Ivation, depending on what, what country you are in. There is the Colzer, which is a larger stainless steel version. There's an LEM. Um, there are, gosh, another other ones, Nesco, because Nesco can be expanded like crazy. Um, there are lots of machines that you can use. But I will say that for most people who I've recommended to, the, the Kasori works really well. If you're looking for doing a lot of produce, I would go with a bigger machine. So the Colzer, the LEM, and Excalibur, um, a Magic Mill 12 shelf they have, I think, and then like a Cabela's, those all work. So I hope they answer it. I wish I could just say, yes, this one machine will fix everything. It just it really, really depends. Okay. Let's see. Uh, 
JDB, uh, mushrooms, wild mushrooms would be awesome. I wish that we had the ability to get them around here, but I don't know enough about picking them on, on my own. And the wild spaces here are not ours to go um, to go forging on. A lot of the space around us is privately owned, so we don't have that option. Okay, um, Pamela, we do London broil for jerky. Are there other meats to dehydrate? You can use any lean cut of beef. Um, or pork or chicken um, or any of the ones that are really lean um, because what you're looking for is no fat because fat makes it a little harder to dry because it makes it more oily, more to clean up, and it makes it non-shelf stable. And in general, beef jerky is optimally stored in the freezer unless you cured it. But um, so the least amount of fat that you can get, the better the jerky comes out. So it's lemon broil. It's round, top round, I think. Um, jerky holic. Uh, if you will go to their website, they have, a, if you'll Google Jerky Holic Best Cuts of Beef, they will have a whole list of the best cuts of beef for you. So I'm not a jerky specific dehydrator. We don't do it much. Um, and they have all the knowledge for doing jerky. So I would always send you over to them. Um, let's see. Queenie Jackson says, I just dehydrated potatoes. Oh, let me see. I blanched them for three minutes after slicing. They turned out beautifully. Well, that's great. I'm glad that worked out for you. That's awesome. Um, can I stack mason jars with dehydrated foods? Cindy, even Ball will tell you it's not recommended to stack them more than two levels. And then there should be something between them to help um, not break seals for canning. But for dehydrated storage, because you're not worried about that seal, you're not storing with as much... Um, with as much weight, I still wouldn't recommend doing too many high because they are not going to be necessarily safe to start stacking them a lot because you're talking about putting glass jars on glass jars that don't have solid surfaces. So I would still only recommend two. There may be people out there doing more, but you want to make sure that that you don't get too much of a tower going that they might lean or somebody hit your shelf and just that little bit of jarring can knock them over. <clears throat> so I hope that helps. Um, in spring and truth, I dehydrated zucchini chips and they got floppy. Is there a way to keep them from getting, fr uh, keep them firm longer? Okay. If you did like super thin ones, the best way to do it is to work with a moisture absorber inside of your jar that helps take care of whatever moisture gets introduced. Every time you open your jar, whatever moisture is in your air goes back in the jar and your food can absorb them. The thinner those cuts are, the, the faster they're going to do that. So what I do is I just throw them back in the dehydrator. You can just run it for another hour or two and it usually takes care of that. So um, if you want that crispy crunch, um, then that's what I would do. If you're talking about storage, that little tiny bit of softness isn't really a problem, but if they get really soft, then yeah, throw them back in uh, and then make sure you're using a moisture absorber if that's the issue for you. Okay, let's see. Ian says he's a newbie. She, he is a newbie to dehydrating from the UK. Really funny, my view video is helpful. And can I dehydrate soy protein? Thank you. Uh, Ian, you can dehydrate pretty much anything. Now, are you talking about soy protein that's already been powdered? Or are you talking about dehydrating edamame to make soy protein? So I need to know the difference there. Edamame can be dehydrated. Um, I don't know enough about that soy protein, how they use it to make that, uh, to make sure that if you just grind them up, that's pure soy protein to use. But it does become a kind of protein powder. But is it a bean powder that has to be processed further to make just the soy protein? That part I don't know because I don't know enough about the proteins done that way, but you can get to it, I think. Okay, so the next question, Renee asks, I have mushroom, I mean, I have mango chunks in my freezer. Well, I like to dehydrate them. Do I have to thaw them out before putting in my dehydrator? I would recommend that you do. Okay, when you put those kind of really fleshy fruits into your freezer, what happens is, is that the freezing process breaks down all of the cell cellular structure in the fruit. So that's when you find that when you start to thaw it, it starts letting go a lot of moisture. So if you put them directly into your dehydrator, you're going to want to put them on sheets to help contain that moisture because they're going to release a lot. And then you could have a problem with a lot of moisture releasing down into your dehydrator, especially if you happen to have a bottom fan dehydrator, then that juice might end up in that fan, which means it's going to smell all the time. It's going to burn that sugar. So it's recommended that you go ahead and thaw them first with a fleshy fruits. Not all fruits need to be done that way, but fleshy fruits and berries. So I would recommend that you do thaw them first. 
just to save yourself some trouble. Now you can experiment and do a few of them that are still frozen and see how it works for you. And then you may be able to, to do that in the future. Um, let's see. Mary, thank you. Uh, the breakdown of all the dehydrators uh, helped her decide what dehydrator to get. That was the whole point of, of the, the post is just to give you a breakdown so that you can make that decision. Because what my recommendation is might not be the best recommendation for you in your home. Um, I hate to see people buying spending a lot of money on a really expensive dehydrator to find out that it, they don't have a space to put it or it's so large that they can't really, they can't move it um, when they don't need it to be there, which is why I love the Sahara, the folding dehydrator that when I get it out, I use it for big projects and then I can put it into my linen closet. It takes very little space. It's amazing, uh, but it's still kind of expensive and it's not best for everybody. So, but I love it. Um, Lisa says that she just powdered raspberries and blackberries from the freezer for her first project. Amazing. Okay. So something I'm going to talk about, uh, because it came up and a dehydrating fail to help fix a dehydrating fail that you may have. When I first started dehydrating, I love the idea of having raspberries year round because I love raspberry everything. Um, but what I don't like is necessarily eating fresh raspberries that aren't great because uh, it's a texture issue and they can be sour. So I thought I'll dehydrate them. They'll be so good when they're dry. The problem is, is that not every raspberry dries well. Sometimes they get really papery thin. There's not a lot of flavor to it. And it's like, it's just not enjoyable as a snack. And that's what I was hoping when I first started. So what I found is that from that failure of realizing that I've got these raspberries that I don't know what to do with. Um, and I don't want to throw them away, but I'm not going to eat them. And I know I'm not going to eat them. And I could, I could cook with them and like put them in breads and stuff, but it was like, but what can I do better? And then I started just getting the inkling way back when about powdering something and making a powder from it. And so what I do is now I powder them. That's how I use them pretty much exclusively. If I dehydrate raspberries, blackberries, um, if I get dewberries from my dad's property, we'll dehydrate them like they are, and then make them into powder. So you may not like how our fruit turns out, like you don't like the texture of it. Mushrooms are the big one like this because a lot of people don't like how the texture of it rehydrated is kind of rubbery. And um, so those projects that you find that you didn't like when they were dried, powder them. They will make it so much more useful in many more things that you never thought you could do with it. Hold on, let me get a drink real quick. Sorry about that. Um, so like I will powder any vegetable that we tried and I didn't like, and I find that I'm not going to really use it again, instead of tossing it or putting it out in the compost pile. Um, I mean, you could give it to your chickens and that's going to feed your eggs, uh, compost feed your garden for the next year, which is going to feed you. So those aren't wastes, but I like to make some of the food more useful to me right then. So powdering is the way to go. And I, this is my favorite powder that I make other than mushroom powder because it tastes like raspberries and it makes everything taste like raspberries. And I love raspberries. Okay. Let me get back up to some of these questions. Hey, Suzanne, glad to have you here. Okay. Stuff and things just purchased uh, Tina, I'll get to you in just a second. I'm sorry. Stuff and Things just purchased a dehydrator and uh, wants to know how much water to rehydrate, i.e. vegetables. Okay. Um, the amount of water that you use, if you're just doing a vegetable, doesn't matter. You want to make sure that you covered the vegetable and then you want to give it a little extra water so that as it reabsorbs that water, you have some extra. Um, and you can always add more water to it if you find that it's absorbing more than you put in. Uh, cause it doesn't, there's no ratio of how much water you have to use for just rehydrating an ingredient. Now, if you're trying to rehydrate a meal, then you need to weigh it before you put it in the dehydrator and then you weigh it after whatever that difference is, is the water that's been removed. And you need to make a notation of that, uh, whether you're doing it in a journal, uh, slight plug here, you know, cause this has like all the journal space for all your projects right there and a place where you can do your volume recording right here. But you want to you want to 
put that someplace that you know that's about how much water that you're going to have to add back to that meal to make it uh, where you can eat. But when you're talking about regular ingredients, the amount of water doesn't matter because you can always add more if you need to. And if you have a little extra, that's broth. Use that broth in your cooking. Whatever meal you're going to make then, just toss it into your meal. You need not waste it at all. Um, and I find that my favorite way to rehydrate anything is just to put it in a jar or a bowl with some water and stick it in the refrigerator overnight because it just, there's nothing that has to happen to it. It will rehydrate by morning and you just need to make sure to get time to cook uh, before you eat it. But a lot of people like to use hot water. I prefer that if you put it in a pan, I mean, I prefer that if I'm going to do it, I put it in a simmering pot of water on the stove instead of relying on some hot water added to a dish and then it gets cold pretty quickly. Keeping it on simmering water keeps that heat in there to make it rehydrate a little faster. Okay, Tina asks, I want to ask if I know whether some of my greens that have gone to seed are okay to dehydrate for using as a powder. I just got behind with my garden. Okay, Tina, the rule of thumb is always, if you'll eat it, use it. If you won't eat it, don't use it. Um, greens that can turn bitter, not all of them turn bitter when they go to seed, so always taste them. If you would like to eat them, then go ahead and use them. If you powder the really bitter ones, that can add bitter flavor to something if you use a lot of it. Um, but you can do it and just know that you might want to keep it separate from your regular green powder so that you're not adding like you can add the bitter, more bitter flavor thing to something that can handle it as opposed to adding it to something like uh, eggs, which might be a little more noticeable. Uh, but remember, you putting those grains into a compost pile to feed your garden later is not a waste. OK. Or let it get compost on its own in the garden if you don't have a compost pile. That's never a waste because you're adding more nutrients into your next year's produce or your next season's produce. Okay. Hey, Suzanne, did I say hi to you already? If not, hi. Um, Pamela, green beans do dehydrate well. It's whether or not you like the texture of them when they rehydrate. And I would never really recommend eating them on their own as a side dish just by themselves. I think that they need to go into another dish. So if you're putting them into cottage pie or shepherd's pie or into any kind of stew or soup, I think they work well that way. Um, I know that in my dehydrating group on Facebook, there was somebody not long ago who did a test. And instead of rehydrating in only water, he actually did it in stock. So he used a broth and rehydrated those beans and those green beans in it and let them simmer in it. And he said it tasted much better that way than using just plain water because seasoning is always going to help how they taste after. But some people don't like the texture so much. So for everything that you do, you need to give it a try to see what you like, because what I say I like, you may not like. And like, I love dehydrated watermelon, um, but it can be one of those flavors that is a real turnoff to other people. And sometimes if I get a bad watermelon, I'll say I'll never do it again because it turned out bad and I won't do it. And then every once in a while I get a really good one and go, oh, we're going to try that again because I did like how that turned out. So it's always going to be a personal taste thing always give things a try. Now, there are some things I can tell you don't ever do that because it's going to be gross. Dehydrating avocados, don't bother because it's not going to work well for you. Um, and you may get a few people who say they liked how it turned out, but for the most part, that's not going to work. So you can take my word on that one. Um, Pamela, the banana chips had no flavor. Okay. How ripe were your bananas when you tried them? Um, if you used non-ripe bananas, like green bananas, those tend to be better for doing powder than they are for eating as a chip. So the riper your banana, the more sugary flavor it develops. But the problem is the more ripe a banana is, the harder it is to dehydrate to something crisp. So you're just going to have to find a happy medium in there somewhere. Now, you could be like me. And after having had the, the thing this year, or well, we actually got it. Uh, no, I had it in August, last August. Um, has it been a year? No, what? Oh, it's been a year. Okay. Doesn't matter. Sorry. I was trying to think about how long has it been since I had it? Uh, but my husband got it like immediately. The, the minute that anybody could start getting it, he got it from work. And he and I both lost our uh, the taste for banana. Um, I can no longer eat banana and not taste all potassium, no matter what variety of that banana is. And there's nothing that I can do to fix it. So um, either I'm going to gain it back over time or I've lost it forever. So bananas will always taste potassium to me and, and chemically, chemically tasting. So 
that taste that you have may be a factor of you used a not quite ripe banana and maybe you should try it again and just give it another chance with something a little riper, but you don't want like those really brown, speckly, really brown sugary bananas. They're great for baking, not great for dehydrating. Unless you make a leather out of it, that might work better. Okay, um, let's see. You're welcome, Marjorie. Hey, not for nothing, Homestead. Glad to have you here. Okay, Roberta's having issues with two months in the food. It's getting soft. So, Roberta, are you talking about that you've stored the food for about two months and it's getting soft in the jar? Here are some things to work about, uh, to, to talk about. So, a dehydrating fail for you is that the food just starts going soft, okay? Dehydrate it fully to start with. Don't dehydrate it until you think, oh, this is about okay. You need to get everything really, really dry before you put it into storage. You can dry things that are not quite dry for snacking on, uh, or if you want to keep it for a little while, you can put it in the fridge or the freezer. You get it dry to a certain point and you want to leave it there, then you need to put it away because any moisture left in the food tends to, to turn to mold over time if there's too much there, okay? So then you need to condition food, which I know is not one of the NCHFP safety things, but it's one thing that you can do to ensure that you've got your food fully dry and catch any moisture issues be before it becomes a problem on your shelf. So you're looking for foods that stick. Um, I think I pulled something like this. No, these aren't. Okay. Can you see this? When I turned over my jar of these are small sweet peppers that I've dehydrated into to, to tiny little dices, you can see that some are sticking to the top of the jar. What you're looking for when you're conditioning are things that stick to the top of the jar and don't come off with a quick shake. Um, now, these sticking right here, this is static that's keeping them. They are not They are not wet. Um, but what you're looking for is that you have stuff here sticking hard and shaking it easily. I mean, shaking it really well is not loosening them or they're clumping together inside the jar. They are not dry. You need to put them back in your dehydrator and dry some more. Um, or you see condensation on the inside. Those things, you can put them right back in. If you see mold, toss the whole thing. You don't want to keep it. So what conditioning does is help you kind of catch that thing before you put it on the shelf. Now, if you're also putting your foods on the shelf in a really large jar with a lot of extra airspace, you're using a jar that's too big, that airspace there then contains moisture. That moisture is going to reabsorb into your food and it's going to make them go soft. Okay. If you open your jar and you use stuff and you close your jar, every time you open your jar, you're introducing food. I mean, moisture into that food and that food is going to reabsorb it. So over time, things can get soft. Um, if you are living in a very humid environment, you're going to have a bigger problem with moisture than somebody who lives in a more arid environment. So first of all, dry your food properly more than you think that you need to because you, can, you can't over dry anything other than some snacky kind of things, uh, fruit leathers and jerkies. Um, if you're putting stuff on the shelf for storage, you cannot over dry it. So dry it and then dry it more. I always, almost always let mine go for at least four or five hours longer than the recommended time because I want it good and dry. Condition it so you can catch any kind of moisture issues first and then store it in a jar that's the right size. So don't store something, uh, I don't have anything handy right here. So let's say if I only had this many peppers, I would change it to a smaller jar. I would not leave it with that much airspace because that much airspace contains moisture. So the last thing that you can do is also add a moisture absorber into your jar. And that will help control the moisture that's being introduced into it that might help keep your food firmer. Now, if you want to, I think I said in the very beginning, that was a long-winded way to talk about that. But you can just throw that stuff back in the dehydrator, dry it some more, and go back. It's okay to do that. So I hope that answered your questions. Let me know. Okay, let's get to the next one. Um, I do Sky ask, if the jars are empty and never used in an original box, is, is it okay to stack higher than two? That's up to you. And it depends on where you're going to stack those um, and what you're doing with them. If you're going to stack them in a heavily um, trafficked area that people can bump into them, I would be very careful uh, because even knocking over those towers of boxes is a thing. Um, so that just depends on where you're going to put them. And that's up to you. Okay, um, Hershey Queen Lisa asks, is butternut squash a good thing to dehydrate? You betcha. Um, I love it and I will dehydrate it. If I can get it, I will process it and will dehydrate it both into cubes that I can add to soups and stews and casseroles because I love it in like a squash, uh, a squash sausage kind of casserole that I hash kind of thing that I like to do in the winters. Um, it can make great soup. 
Uh, you can do it in a powdered form so that you can have mashed butternut squash anytime that you want it. Um, so it's a great thing. You just need to cook it first, then dry it. Don't try to dry it from raw. Now, I know some people will sometimes do squash in some root vegetables. They'll shred it and then dry it and then powder it. I really think that for most of them, your best bet for storage and to contain the right nutrients and have it last long on the shelf would be to cook those things first and then go through the process because the enzymatic process that makes food go bad faster uh, is stopped when you blanch it or cook it. So that's the reason that, do, that you do those. Okay. When dehydrating my first tomatoes, it's taking way more than the recommended five to eight hours of my dehydrator instructions. What am I doing wrong? Simple Russ, you're never doing anything wrong that way. Those books, don't even look at those times, okay? Never, ever, ever, ever look at the times. Your food's going to be dry when it's dry and not a minute more. Just be patient. Let them dry until they're finished. The problem is, depending on what machine you have or what book you might be looking at, those, especially manuals of not national brand dehydrators, are written by people who don't dehydrate. They're, the machine was made. They, you know, they can crank out a machine, but they don't know a lot about dehydrating. And so they they don't necessarily write books for practical dehydrating. They write it where they might have found that information online. I'm not going to say they're I'm not going to say they're all like that, but that's what I'm finding. Okay, so while they may have a, a good recommended temperature, the times are going to be so dependent on how you prepped your food, how much moisture is in it, what your humidity level in your house is, what the humidity level in your area is, um, how strong your machine is, and uh, I'm sure there's two more. I think I always list. So never go by drying time to be the thing that the book says. Always go by drying time about what your food is actually doing. That's what you need to do. Um, I hate that people feel like they fail when the time says it's supposed to be this way and they're not done. They think they've done something wrong. You haven't. Just be patient. Let them dry. Okay, They will get there. It just may take a lot longer than what the book says that it should be. So I hope that helped. Just keep going. Patience is a virtue in dehydrating, and it's really hard because you just want that stuff to be done and you can use it, but it just takes a little time. Okay, let's see. The next question, should um, should frozen, um, I just lost it because that happened. Okay, Susan Isaacson asked, should frozen blueberries be thawed before dehydrating? Susan, that's always going to be a thing up to you. Like I said earlier, fleshy fruits and berries tend to release a lot of water when they, a lot of moisture when they're thawing um, in the dehydrator. So you want to protect your dehydrator, depending on which one you have, either use a, you know, sheet at the bottom of it. So it's easier to clean up. Use, if you're using mesh, I would actually use some parchment on top of the mesh because blueberries can stain. If you care about that kind of thing, I think that stained sheets and mesh are a sign of a happy dehydrator and a full pantry, so that doesn't bother me so much. Uh, but you can do it both ways and see what you think. I will often just throw them on because as they thaw and then start to warm up, the skin breaks on their own, or I can just go push them a little bit and make sure that they're broken. I don't have a problem with the juice that it releases because it's not a problem for me, but it may be for you, so you might want to do that ahead of time. Or, you know, experiment both ways and see how you like it and how you want to deal with both of them. If you have a bottom fan machine, though, I would always recommend thawing first. Okay, um, not for nothing. Homestead asked, if I wanted to dehydrate watermelon for hot tea, would you dehydrate like jerky pieces in your watermelon video and then grind to a powder? So are you uh, are you adding the powder to your tea blend? Um, I would, you could do it either way. You can puree it up front, do it as a leather, dry the leather, store the leather, then powder it when you're ready to use it. Uh, you don't want to powder too much of the watermelon beforehand because it will be so sticky and it will clump and there's almost nothing you can do to fix that. Uh, no matter how much, how many moisture absorbers you put in it and no matter how much arrowroot powder you put in it, that will turn everything cloudy. You, you just want to powder it as you need it for very short term. So um, you can do it either way. You can do it as the jerky and just get it really good and dry or just puree it and make leather um, and then break the leather pieces up. Uh, and you might find that you need to dry that leather again um, or the jerky again over time because it's so full of sugars and sugars are hygroscopic. They want to absorb moisture. They like draw moisture to them like crazy. So watermelon, because it's so sugary, is going to be a little problematic. So uh, just watch that. You can do it either way. Either way will work. Okay. Hey, a seed on good soil. Good to have you here. 
Okay, um, Darla asked, if I dehydrate onions and garlic together, will they influence the taste of each other? No, nah, you're going to be fine. I do recommend you keep aromatics away from other really, uh, I don't want to say soft food, but delicate food, because you might get a little transfer there. So I wouldn't want to do garlic and onions with bananas, um, or I wouldn't want to do it with strawberries. But um, there's no safety issue about anything other than meat. You don't want to keep any kind of protein going with other foods because you just run that risk of cross-contamination. So you don't want to do that. But it, but the recommendation is keep light temperatures together and you're pretty cool. So you can do, and then keep the aromatics separately from those kind of more fussy things and then do mushrooms separately from everything. All right, let's see. The next question is, um, what's the brand of my dehydrator, Helen? I have a Kasori Premium Stainless Steel Dehydrator. I have an Excalibur Dehydrator. I have a Sahara Folding Dehydrator. I have a Nesco Dehydrator, and I have a Nesco Snapmaster Junior Dehydrator, which is this tiny little cute dehydrator, and I don't have it where I can get to it, but it's like this little mini thing that's great for RVs, uh, but it's it's perfect for really small projects. I can just throw it on the counter. It doesn't make so much noise, and it makes a problem, and it's just so cute. Um but yeah, I have all of those and I've had a couple other ones in the past that I've either used and gotten rid of or used and given to somebody else because I upgraded. Um, I had a Kasori stackable for a little while. Didn't like that one as much. I would prefer Nesco if I'm going to go with a stackable. Um, but those are the ones I have. The one I use most that you see in my videos, it's right. I'm not going to open that door right now. I don't know what's behind the door. Uh, I use the Kasori Premium. It's that stainless steel smaller one. Um, that's what I use most just because it fits that space right now until I can come up with another uh, another space. Oh, I have so, it's going to be so, okay. I have this project that's in my head that I've talked to my husband about that I think I'm going to get to do in the near future. We'll see, but I'm going to be so excited about some extra space for dehydrating. I can't wait. And when I get to show it to you, that'll be awesome, but it's going to be down the road a little bit, but I can have more than one dehydrator out at one time and just right there where I can just put everything together and just dry everything. All the things can dry at once. I'm so excited. And it may make it to where I can get a, a Cabela's 160 liter dehydrator with all the trays that I can do all the things. I'm so excited. Um, okay, but that's obviously that's gonna be down the road a little bit, but other people get to redo their kitchens. I can't redo my kitchen. I'm never gonna get more space in my kitchen, but we think we've carved out a little space in the house that doesn't require me kicking out a kid um, that might work. And so we're gonna start talking to some contractors about it. And I'm excited. Okay, can, um, let's see, Sandra asked, can freezing hard vegetables before dehydrating do the same thing as blanching? No, because it's not the same process. Freezing it just freezes it. It doesn't, it doesn't stop the enzymatic process that, that makes your food go bad. Uh, it doesn't cook it down a little bit so that, it, that it stops browning for those things that need to be browned. Um, it, it doesn't break the fibers down the same way. And if it needs to be blanched before cooking it, it should be blanched before freezing it in most instances. So um, broccoli should be blanched before you freeze it. So broccoli should be blanched before you do, you know, not freezing it only isn't going to stop it from turning brown sooner. Now that doesn't mean that something, sorry, ah, uh, the dust, um, doesn't mean that some things can't happen that way, but I wouldn't recommend it to replace blanching. Okay. Uh, stuff and things. Thing. I wasn't, you know, I, I kind of snuck that book thing in there because it just happened to work. But yeah, I created it specifically for that reason. There are a ton of really great dehydrating books on the market. You didn't need another dehydrating book from me that, that were that way. And so I tried to think really hard about what would make mine different. Um, I know some of you might not know the story, but you might not. So I'll tell it really quickly. I was approached by a publisher last year to, to create a new book. And when I said, I don't want to create a book that you want, I want to create a book that I want. We had some talk back and forth and we weren't able to come to a consensus about what they wanted. And the cookbook market is a lot different now than it used to be. And books are often written um, by, well, I'm not going to go to all that, but they're, they're not written necessarily from the, the writer's point of view. They're written by the publisher and they want the writer to do it their way. And I just wasn't willing to do that because we didn't need another one. There were too many good ones out there. So that's why I came up with this idea that you have the whole first part of this book is how to dehydrate things, 
Okay, it's how to dehydrate in general. Then it's a journal broken up by every food that tells you how to dry it and then gives you all the space to take notes and to take all the measurements that you need and makes it to where it makes it a more useful book for you. Lots of room to write. That's what I was really trying to get to. Okay, let's see the next question. Oh, <laughs> Kathleen. All right, Kathleen wants me to show the book again. All right, this is the Dehydrating Basics in Journal for Beginners. It is full of general, let me get to the front of it, um, good general information about how to dehydrate. You can take notes here if you need to. You know, I just made space for you to write stuff uh, because that's how I write in all of my cookbooks. I've got notes everywhere, but there's not always room, so I made sure there's room. Sorry, the light's kind of doing that. Then in this section is how to dehydrate all the foods. Okay, there's like 115 pages that are how to dehydrate it. So you've got your instructions here, your general drying uh, set up here, notes for you to take for the next time you do the project, how you would change it, what you might add, what you might not do, so that you can always keep track of your project here. Then there is um, space here to do your volumes. I've got some tips on how to serve it, what you might do with it next, you know, those kind of things here. I added that. And then if you buy this journal in the back of the book, there is a reference page for you. Uh, after the recipes, there's a reference page on how you can get a blank page that you can just kind of add to it. I mean, I know you can't add to the coil so much, but you can print on a blank page for those projects that I don't record or if you need more of them. Um, and then if you'd rather, if you're like pretty well versed in dehydrating and you don't need the how to part in the beginning, the dehydrating journal, which is also available as a coil, but I just bought it in the soft cover so I could see what it, how it came out. It actually has only the, the journal pages. That's all that's here. And then the few recipes at the back, um, just like that. Well, no, let me get to them. They've also got the recipes at the back, but this is only the dehydrating journal portion. It doesn't have the dehydrating basics. Do not buy both of these books. You don't need both. You need one or the other, um, but I kind of tried to make sure that you had both ways depending on what your needs were. So thanks, Kathleen. Uh, that'd be the last plug. I'm not going to plug that one anymore. Okay. Let's see next. Hey, Mama Crypto, how are you? Um, hey, Kathy. Put bitter greens in salty water overnight. Helen, does that help them not become bitter anymore? Um I don't know how that does anything other than make them just salty on top of the bitter. But, okay, if it works, great. That's a good tip. Okay, Tina asked. Um, oh, no, she's just talking about uh, if they're bitter, she'll put them in her compost pile because uh, that's, you know, that's another way to use it. It's not wasting it at all. Um, let's see. Um, I can't pronounce your name. It's uh, freeze. Freeze ink. I'm not sure how that how to say your name. Uh, those pastes are great. Just remember, if they're oily, if they contain oils, they they could turn rancid on your shelf. So if they were high in oil, I would store those in your freezer just to make sure that they don't turn rancid because you don't want your project to to go bad because that's one thing that you can't come back from. There are a lot of dehydrating fails that you can fix or you can, you know, alter, you know, powders and everything are a great way to fix projects that don't go well for you. But something turning rancid, there's no coming back from that. It's gross. It smells gross. It tastes gross. And so I don't want to have you lose that. So just make sure if there was a lot of oil in that paste, put it in the freezer. Um, Laurie asked, what rule of thumb do you use for dehydrating several items at once besides temperature? Um, again, you don't want to put really high aromatics like peppers and onions and garlic with something that's pretty delicate like strawberries. I know people have done it and they don't have an issue, but if you don't need to do them together, like practically some things, you just sometimes have to break that rule of thumb because if you have one tray of something and you have almost full machine, um, do the tray together. I mean, because it's more practical and you may not have the problem. Now I wouldn't do meat that way. If I had meat, I wouldn't stick a tray of strawberries in with the meat. Uh, even if I put them on the top shelf, you still have that circulation that's cross contaminating and you don't do that. But, um, and I never do mushrooms with anything else because mushrooms should always be done by themselves just to stop any chance of those spores from mushrooms that still have them getting onto the rest of your food and getting into your pantry and creating a problem. Or if somebody in your house happens to be allergic, you shouldn't be doing mushrooms in your house anyway, okay? But you just don't want that cross-contamination of those spores. Now, that doesn't mean that I've never done it before, but I make a habit not to do it. So I have once or twice put one tray of mushrooms in with other stuff, but I don't make a habit of doing it all the time because you just don't want to take that chance because practicality does play into things sometimes that you just need to get stuff done. So 
there isn't really a rule of thumb. Keep light temperatures together. Keep the aromatics, meats, and mushrooms separate. Otherwise, you can do you can do vegetables and fruit at the same time if you need to, and just drop the temperature down a little bit so that you're not overheating those things that might get too brown if they get a higher temperature. And just know that those fruits will take a little longer. Okay, but they're fine to do together. Okay, let's see who else. Hey, Laura, it's good to have you here. Um, Lisa Neff, yes, you can plant, you can dehydrate plantains. Um, I know people make uh, powder out of them and then use them for baking. So yeah, you can do that. Now, I've never had a plantain chip that's been dehydrated. I don't know that they will be good as a snack because they don't have a lot of flavor that way because they're starch. They're not, they're starchier than a banana is. So you would want to experiment with that. But I know that people have used it for powder. Okay, Laura says, after I conditioned my mushrooms, a few weeks later, I discovered they had darkened and were not crisp. I didn't see any mold or condensation, but I picked them for safety's sake. But I pitched them for safety's sake. Okay, Laura, um, they were fine. Sometimes if you, if you um, did you get them wet? Like, did you rinse them off before drying them? Because I do that and they will turn darker than if you put them in there dry. Like if you just dry brush them to get them clean and you, and you dried them, uh, they say, they stay a lighter color, but when you, if you rinse them, they will turn darker. And so, um, that's, that's might be why they turn darker. If they were still dry, then they were fine and you could have kept them. Um, let's see, they had darkened and were not crisp. Now, not crisping, did they not just go snap or did they break or were they really, really bendy? Okay. Those are, those are different, different stages of being dry. If they were really bendy, then I probably would have done like you and gotten rid of them uh, because they were fungus and I might not have redried them, but if they were just not quite as crisp as they were crisp as they were when they went back in, I probably would have dried those. So, um, but, but you do what you need to do to make yourself feel safe about what you're drawing. Cause that's the thing. I got a lot of flack from people when I uh, dropped all those uh, chilies in the kitchen, like, just blow it off. They'll be fine. It's like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not taking the chance of stuff that's going into storage. I just won't do it for my house. I've had really bad food poisoning before that put me in the hospital. I never, ever, 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 ever want to go through that again. And I don't, I try not to take the chance on things if at all possible. Okay. Let's see. Can I, can you use jars pre-used like shop bought pickle jars reused? Uh, And, and I think you're asking who taught me how to dehydrate. Seven things, you can use any airtight container. It doesn't matter what the container is. It can be glass jars bought from the grocery store shelf. It can be plastic containers. The more rigid, the better, because those tend to be not air permeable. So air doesn't flow in and out of that plastic. Um, and they tend to hold their seal with the, with the lead better. Uh, but good plastic containers, I always recommend over really cheap plastic containers. Um, you can use Mylar bags. You can use uh, the, the plastic vacuum seal bags. As long as you can get it airtight, anything that you use. And airtight doesn't mean vacuum sealed. Airtight means that air can't flow in and out of it um, at all. So you have things like you may have, like people recommend using Parmesan, the, the grated Parmesan stuff that you can buy off the shelf at the grocery store. Those green lids that have the pop top that you can shake, those lids are not airtight. Okay. They do allow air to come in and out of the, out of the jar, even if it's a glass jar. So I don't recommend storing with those. They can be something to use for short term, like to season with, but I don't recommend those for storage because they're not airtight. So you can use anything that's airtight. I happen to use canning jars because they're available to me easily. Uh, they're just what I like to use. I can get the sizes that I need exactly the same so I can store them easier in the space that I have, but you can use anything. And I am uh, probably... 75% self-taught. I studied, I experimented, I went and read anything that I could read um, when I was having problems trying to figure something out. I've learned a lot from people that I communicate with, either you guys uh, or other people who do things like this more professionally. Um, I just, I wanted to learn how to do it well. And so I am mostly self-taught. Um, they don't have a master dehydrator program in my area. So I can't go take the certification to say I'm a master dehydrator. Um, and I know there's still so much more for me to learn. So it's just more experimentation, more reading up, more experimentation. So that's how I learned. Okay. Um, 
Ren asks, do I have a resource that shows how much dehydrated food is needed in place of fresh? For instance, I dehydrated cabbage. If the recipe calls for two cups of cabbage, how much dehydrated? For two cups, okay, here's the general rule of thumb. One cup of fresh equals one quarter cup to one third cup dry, depending on the volume, how big it is, how it fits in the space, that could be a little adjusted there. That will equal one tablespoon powder. So if you have one cup to a quarter cup dry, then you're gonna use a half a cup to make two cups. Okay, that would be the conversion. You can find some charts like that. Like the, there's some freeze dry companies. I think it's Harvest Foods, Harvest something. Har it's not Harvest Right. That's the freeze dry company, but it's a Harvest uh, some kind of food company that does a breakdown of it for freeze dried foods, which don't quite go the same way because freeze dried foods stay the same size, dehydrated foods shrink. So you can't quite use that same equivalency. So, um, just use that rule of thumb. In cooking, it doesn't matter. You can get close. If you want more in there, put more in there. If you want less in there, put less. It doesn't matter. Now, if you're baking, you need to get a little more specific because baking is a chemical process that the amounts of things that you add to it make they're a little more necessary to get it close. But, um, but the other thing that you can do, if you need to be more specific, when you start your project, take out a cup or weigh it if you need to go by weight. Um, and then weigh it before you go in and then weigh it or measure it when you come out and then make that notation so that you know when I did it, this is how much you need it, which is why that little volumetric thing, that little that little yield thing on the bottom of the book uh, is great. That's what it's there for, for you to record that. So those are the two ways you can do it. But for the most part for cooking, just toss in some. It'll work. Okay. Um, Carolyn asks, can I put dehydrated eggplant, tomatoes, potatoes, and possibly onion in the same jar? It depends on why, Carolyn. If you're going to make a meal in a jar, then certainly you can. If you're going to do it just for storage, I wouldn't recommend it because your onions can flavor your tomatoes. Tomatoes don't last as long as other foods do. Dehydrated, they tend to break down a little sooner, which is why your shelf life of canned tomato products in the grocery store have a shorter shelf life, shelf life than other vegetables that you buy. Um, so if you're doing for storage for long term and you just want to put a bunch in together, I, I don't recommend it. Use some smaller jars if that's it. But if you're doing something for a meal in a jar, then definitely, yeah, you can. Okay, let's see. Lori. Um, oh, Lori says that the video I did on how to use the Kasori is what made her decide to buy one. I'm glad you really like it, Lori. Um, that's good. I'm glad. Um, the machine's great. I mean, the only problem with it, I mean, the absolute only problem with it is that it's not big enough for somebody who does a lot. And I wish sometimes that I had bought the magic mill, that's just like it, but a bigger version of it. Um, when I bought this one, um, but it turned out to be the perfect size for most people. So <clears throat> I always need a little extra space because I produce so much. Hold on a second. <coughs> I don't talk this much in, in real life and it's like, <clears throat> okay, somebody said they have a dedicated dehydrator for Rora, Rora says she has or he, I'm sorry, I don't I don't know your gender. Um that you have a dedicated one for each. Why? Why do you do it separately? Because they're not gonna in general, unless you're using a really um cheap dehydrator, they don't really flavor the dehydrator later. But that's totally cool if you do. I'm just curious why. <coughs> I'm really sorry, guys. Lori, I'm pretty sure that I answered this. Maybe you came in a little late. Mushrooms are separate so that you don't get spore. The spores that come from mushrooms is a fungus. And the possibility of putting that fungus into another food that you put in a jar on a shelf can be a problem. It's generally not going to be unless you're doing all unless you're doing it all the time. But it's just one of those rules of thumb that we suggest so that you can just make sure that never happens. So that's the reason why. Okay. Hey, Margie. Good to have you here. I'm glad you made it. Um, Roberta says that for her food getting soft in storage is because she's using too big of a jar. So yeah, always keep the jar size that you're going to use to be the same volume as the food that you're putting into it. So, um, I don't have one handy. If you're going to use this with pepper, then use a jar that fits it. If you've only got this much pepper, get a smaller jar or a smaller container, whatever you're using. Okay. Okay. 
Sally asks, what's something that you can dehydrate while dehydrating your marshmallows? You can dehydrate anything while you're dehydrating marshmallows. I like to dehydrate my marshmallows hot. So I use 150 F, uh, which is uh, 50, 55, close to 60 C. Um, 150, oh, 150 is 65 C. Okay, so I like to de dehydrate my marshmallows fast and hard because it helps get them going through faster. Now, if I'm doing bigger marshmallows or marshmallows with a lot of color added to them or uh, any of the, the fluffier ones, they will swell up. So you drop the temperature down for those. But at 150, there's not a lot that you should dehydrate that hot um, because it's just too hot for fruits and vegetables that you start getting some browning issues. Um, so drop the temperature. And it just means your marshmallows are going to take longer. You can dehydrate anything with them. They don't really pick up flavor unless you're going to do onions. And I'm not going to say that marshmallows won't taste a little oniony if you put onions in with them. But you can do them with any fruit and they'll be fine. Okay. Hey, Deborah, glad to have you here. Um, Sandra asks, is it okay to season tomatoes when they're dehydrating? Now I love seasoning tomatoes. I make tomato chips with some Italian seasoning on top of them and they taste like pizza. Uh, they are so good. I season chips all the time. Now, if you're talking about just seasoning for the heck of it, what are you going to put those tomatoes in later? Um, like there's no reason to season diced tomatoes that you're getting ready to do for cooking. I wouldn't bother seasoning those until you're putting them into the dish that you want to use because you don't know how that flavor is going to translate once it is dry like things can tend to get more concentrated and so if you've added that into a recipe that already has some more of that flavor in there it may just be too much so it, it, i'm not going to say you can't do it but i would keep ingredients that you're going to use in other meals non-seasoned and season it at the end but if you're doing them for chips season away put just go experiment go play um okay Let's see. Rora, you never have to, you don't refrigerate anything that's been dehydrated unless it's a protein that you've not had cured. So like um, beef jerky that's not been cured, like with a curing salt, that should be optimally stored in the freezer. Anything that you dehydrate, if you dehydrate it fully and it's fully dry, it never needs to be put in the freezer or refrigerator because it's shelf stable. That's the whole point for it. Um... Hey, little Urban Homestead. Welcome. Okay. Let me get down to the next question. Hey, Ronnie. Good to have you here. Lori, uh, you're welcome. Um, Laura says, very bendy mushrooms. Thank you for the info. Okay. She was talking about not getting really good solid dried mushrooms on the shelf and they turn bendy. Those are kind of might not rehydrate those. That Because that, that's me. Mushrooms are fungus and I, that's up to you though. Okay, so Matthew asks, is it okay for storage to put purchased freeze-dried foods in glass jars after they've been open one to two years, not 20-year time frame? Yes, you can do that. Just know that once you've opened that container that's been commercially sealed, uh, you need to put them back in the jar and you need to vacuum seal them again. You've lost that long-term storage. You can no longer go by that time. And that's only a guesstimate that they have. That's not a promise that it's going to really last that long because foods just are going to react the way foods react. Um, but if you vacuum seal them again, you can get some more time out of them. They will tell you that you've got a year. Okay. Once you've opened their jar, I mean, their container, you've got a year. But yeah, vacuum seal it, put it back on your shelf, and, and you're good. And you want it you want to make sure it's in a dark place. But I mean, that's just the thing about doing any kind of dried foods, whether it's freeze dried, whether it's dehydrated, light kills, moisture kills, oxygen kills, heat kills. So the, the, the drier, the darker, the cooler you can keep it. That's the best for, for food storage. Can I store dehydrated products in my unheated garage if they are vacuum sealed in jars? Little Urban Homestead, as long as it's cold, you're fine. If it's hot, don't, because the heat kills your food. It's going gonna, it's gonna to shorten the shelf life like crazy. Now, what I would be concerned with is if your unheated garage freezes and then gets hot and then freezes and gets hot um, because you start running into condensation issues inside of your jar. So I don't know your situation. I don't know where you live. If you can move some non-food products out to the garage instead and keep your food products in. That's always going to be the best bet, but I know it's not always the way for everybody. And I know in years when there was no air conditioning, people had to store it where they could. But if you want to extend the best possible shelf life, keeping it in a cool, dark, dry place is where you need to go. 
if it's really cold, it's fine. Uh, the heat is what's going to kill you. Okay, let's go to the next question. Is there a good, uh, any kind of meat? Oh, for jerky? Um, Betty, I think it was Betty. I just, uh, I lost it. I'm sorry. It's hard to scroll here. Brenda. Okay, Brenda, go to Jerkyholic. Go just Google jerky holic best cuts of beef for jerky. That that is where I will send everybody all the time. It tells you exactly what kind of beef makes the best cuts for jerky. Okay. Um Mama Crypto, thank you. Uh, let's see. Writing space. I wanted to dehydrate apples to the point of being snappy and able to turn into powder, but I was wondering, would rehydrating the ground apples turn it into apple sauce texture? Um, okay, let me try that again. You can dry apples and make powder for them perfectly. And then when you rehydrate it, it is not going to make another apple. It's going to make a sauce. I mean, it's going to be apple sauce. It's not going to be quite like apple sauce because you cook it, um, but you're using it more as a... Uh, try that is a flavorant and as a sugar it doesn't replace sugar but it can make things taste a little sweeter uh the powder also can act like pectin in things some people will use it that way so it doesn't really turn into applesauce i hope that makes sense it will turn if you add enough water to it it becomes applesauce like but it's not cooked the same way so it doesn't quite have the same flavor Okay, R.A. ask. I have tomatoes dehydrated from last year. Is it safe to powder them and use them? Are they too old? They're fine. As long as the quality is still good, uh, you're fine to use them. Just know that you don't want to powder them for too long because tomatoes break down if you've already had them for a year. Uh, and powders tend to start losing their potency. And I don't mean potency like the flavor, the texture, the vitamins. The more you process something, the faster it starts to lose those things, which is why I recommend never powdering for more than like six months at a time because you don't want to just store it as a powder and start losing any of that. Um, although sometimes powders will last longer. The mushroom powder lasts forever almost, but not everything does. So that's why just powder on demand. But yes, you can use those older tomatoes. As long as the flavor and texture is still there now, you can do that. Oh, uh, Laura, that's where mine sits. See, I mean, you know that my Kasori sits in my dryer because that's where it has to go. Okay, Marybeth asks, can you over dehydrate foods? I forgot to check it. Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, you cannot over dehydrate anything that you plan to go into storage. Fruit leather, yes, but we happen to actually like crispy fruit leather because we just prefer it that way. Uh, jerky, you can over dehydrate. Some things, if you're trying to get like the softer texture, like you're used to from the store and you want to do it with dehydrated, uh, that's a preference thing about when, you know, if you went too long for that. But when you're talking about storage, you can't be over dehydrate anything. You can use too hot of a temperature for things. You can use too hot of a temperature for things that might turn brown like citrus. You want to drop those temperatures. So it's not over dehydrating, it's overheating. Um, so no, for storage, you cannot over dehydrate. The more moisture you can get out, the better. Okay, somebody's going to ask me, and I'm going to tell you what my what my thing is. Can you dehydrate eggs? Um, let me see. Let me get to it. Can I dehydrate eggs? Margie asks. Okay. The, the safe thing I'm going to tell you is that it's not recommended by the National Center for Home Food Preservation, Home Food Preservation, which is like the the regulatory, no, not regulatory, they are the safety standard about preserving foods in the United States. They will tell you, don't. Uh, I'm not going to tell you, do. I don't dehydrate eggs. I don't find it's worth the risk. I don't find that the quality works well after. It's not something I want to do. I also don't have enough eggs to do that with. I don't have a flock that I need to preserve. Uh, if you will Google nine ways to preserve eggs safely, that will come up to, to my post that will tell you, here are the ways to do something if you're going to do it with eggs, and one of them will be dehydrating. You can go look there, look at it, and decide if you want to do it or not. I don't recommend doing eggs. I know there are tons of people who do, uh, but I just tend to stay on the side that they're not recommended to be safe. You need to store them in the freezer anyway, uh, and I would rather buy freeze-dried. But again, I don't have a flock that I'm trying to you know, to keep those eggs. Otherwise I will freeze raw eggs uh, and I will, you know, do other things, but I, I don't dehydrate, but yes, you can um, go look there. Okay. Let's get to the next question. Um, is it necessary to refrigerate dehydrated foods or vegetables in the vacuum cell? Again, raw, no, you don't have to dehydrate anything that's fully dry. It's shelf stable. 
Okay, let's get to the next thing. Oh, we're getting long here. We've already gone by an hour. Uh, if you're wanting to sit around, I can sit around. We can still talk some more. I'm fine with that. Um, let's see. With mirepoix, should I separate the onions from the celery and carrots, or is it okay to dry them together since they will be used together? Dry them together. Make it easy on yourself. Don't sit there and pick things separately. You can do them separately if it makes it more convenient for you to use those ingredients for other things. But if you're doing mirepoix, do it together. I mean, uh, when I did it for video, I did it separately and show how you could mix it uh, just because it makes it more usable for things later because I do it in larger quantities. But, you know, the next time I do it, it's going to be together in one big, huge thing. Just make sure you get those carrots blanched first because they need it. And the celery, mm, you might want to blanch it since you're doing the carrots anyway, just blanch them together. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Okay, Brenda from Scotland says a big failure for her is cherry powder. It's so sticky. Any tips appreciate it. It's, cherry powder is going to be sticky. It is so dense and so full of sugars. Uh, that's what makes it sweet like that. It's going to be sticky. Okay. So ways to help alleviate the stickiness is to fully, 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 fully dry those things until they are hard little pucks. Okay. You don't want to get them just sort of dried. You want them fully dried. You can also puree them first and get that to a crisp breakup puree, not a fruit leather. You want it crisp and, and, and shattery. Okay. Then when you powder them, only powder as much as you need for a certain amount of time. Don't over process them because the more that you sit there and process it, the hotter it gets, the more it makes that stuff start compacting and gets, uh, gets all, you know, into a big lump and it makes it problematic then you can spread the stuff out on a part piece of parchment paper and put it on a cookie sheet i tend to also put it on top of a drying like a cooling rack for cookies i put that on top of my cookie sheet put the parchment paper on top of that that way it's not touching that really hot solid surface metal i turn my oven on to pre-warm it and then i turn it off you don't want to cook the stuff you just want a warm oven. You put everything in. The warm oven will help get rid of the moisture. You pull it out. You break it up because it's probably going to look like it clumped and it didn't. It just needs to be broken up. And then you put it in your, after it's cooled off, you put it in your jar for storage. Okay. The thing is you can add arrowroot powder to, to most powders to help them stop clumping, but you don't necessarily want to do that to cherry powder if you're using it for things like teas because it will make your tea cloudy. It's the same as cornstarch. You know, it will make that stuff cloudy, but I just prefer it to cornstarch. So it depends on how you're going to use it to whether or not you want to put the arrowroot powder in it. So only powder as much as you need for a short term so you're not having to deal with like a huge clump. Okay, I hope that helps. Can I dehydrate meat and not make jerky? Deborah, you can, okay? But again, it's a protein that's not cured. It needs to be stored in the freezer. If you're going to do chicken uh, for meats, you want to uh, use pressure canned chicken or commercially canned chicken for the best result when it rehydrates because it's been the, the cooking process has broken those fibers. So they come back better. Um, you want to pre-cook chicken before you ever dry it, no matter what you're doing. Um, if you want to do meat, you don't want to use any kind of really fatty meat because that's going to turn rancid over time. You're just going to waste your time unless you put it in the freezer. You can do hamburger meat. Uh, I choose to boil it first to get rid of more of the fat, uh, but you can, um, cook it really, really well, then you're going to want to get as rid of as much fat as possible. So use some paper towels to sop it up. Um, some people will rinse it with boiling water. Don't do it in your sink because that fat gets in your sink and that's never good. Hmm, excuse me. Um, and some people will keep that on the shelf, but because if you're not really well experienced at it and it's got fat in it, it will turn rancid over time or it could, I won't say will, it could. So that's why it's recommended that those things get stored in the freezer anyway. Now that doesn't mean you can't do it and put it in the freezer and then take it out to go hiking or camping or backpacking. You can still do that because the short time that you're going to have it out is fine. It's whether or not you want to keep it on the shelf for two years and risk that. I know folks do it. I just like to to give the worst case scenario so that you don't waste it in case, okay? Um, so yeah, you can, and I always dry them hot. Okay, let's see. Uh, thank you, Writing Space, I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for the, for the more, uh, thanks for the, the accolades, folks. I really appreciate it. I mean, my heart is to teach you how to do this stuff so that you can do it for yourself and fill that pantry up for your family because it's necessary. Uh, Marvin, I've never done pemmican. It can be done. You're going to have to go research it online to go find out. There are some great sites that can teach you how to do it. I just don't. Um, my my um, humidity level in my area is not something that I want to do pemmican in at all. 
no matter how many fans I've got running over it, it's just too much humidity and I don't want to take the chance. So I don't do it. Okay. Casey, you know, YouTube doesn't always give notifications and I'm sorry about that. You can always watch the replay later. Um, it will replay and you can just watch it and catch up. Um, let's see. When dehydrating frozen blueberries, I have them at my Excalibur for two days and they weren't hard crunchy. What do I, did I do something wrong? Okay. First of all, no, remember they take forever and they may take you three or four days, depending on your, your weather in your home, like the humidity level in your home, uh, how densely you pack the trays. If you've got that skin to break, even frozen, you need to kind of put some pressure on them as they're thawing to make sure that skin breaks. Freezing it should work, but sometimes they don't. So you need to give it a little extra pressure around your trays to break those off. Um, you're never going to look at crispy. Okay. They're never going to get crispy. Your crispy is for things that you cut thin. Uh, and they're rarely for chunks of fruit because fruit's not going to ever get really crispy like that. Um, but what you're looking for is hard um, or you want it raisin-like. But I tend to go hard because when you think raisin-like in a store, it's really soft because they put preservation things in there to keep them soft. You can't really do that well at home and make sure that it's not moisture for things to go bad later. So just let them dry. You've done nothing wrong. Okay, just give it some more time. Okay, before everybody starts going away because they've been here forever, I want to do a giveaway, okay? I'm going to do one book today just because we've gone so long. It will be for the ebook version of this book, okay? Uh, just because it'll take forever to get it to you. Um, so the ebook is a way for you. You can print these off, all the pages that you need. So you'll have all the information on whatever device that you use, but you can print off each of the pages here and create your own binder. Uh, and you only need to print off the books the pages that you need. You don't need to print off everything until you need it. So it makes it a little more versatile that way. Um, so what I'm going to do um, is, let's just do a number thing because it's an easier thing to do. And stop asking questions at this point. I'm going to, uh, because I don't want to lose a question that's important and I'll go back. Um, Carolyn, they don't only last a year. They just don't last as long as other things. The tomatoes, uh, they just have a shorter shelf life. So you're good. They just won't last as long as other things. Um, that's all. That's great, Mary. I'm glad that your son likes it. Do you know how much my electric bill might be increased? Laura, you have to go do the conversion. You have to check what your local rates are. And then you, you do some black magic math um, to figure that out. I've got a if you go to my website or, or Google cost to run dehydrator, the purposeful pantry, I've got a way for you to figure that out and you can see what the cost is. In my home, I've never had uh, the bill go up by a lot that wasn't affected by air conditioning. So um, even in the winter, at the most, I'm paying about a dollar a day if I'm running at full blast, 24 hours a day, all the time. But at 75 cents is probably what I'm paying until the electric rates go up and then that changes it some. Um, but it, it just depends on your machine and what your local rates are. Um, I think, is there a limit to continuous use of a dehydrator? You need to look at your manual, Brenda. Your manual will tell you how long it can run before you need to give it a break. Okay, so we're stopped. No more questions. Okay, giveaway. We're going to a giveaway time. So I'm thinking of, I'm going to write it down so that we can say that I wrote it down. I'm thinking of a number between one and 42, okay? Somewhere in there, I'm thinking about that number. Whoever says it first that I see on my screen because of the scroll that happens, don't 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 guess them yet or I'm gonna have to change it. I didn't say go, I'm gonna have to change it. Okay, when I say go, then we'll start guessing. We'll have to come up with another number now. Okay, we're gonna change that. So the way I see the scroll happening on my screen may be different than the scroll seen on your screen. So we're gonna have to go by what I see. And I'm sorry if you answer before somebody else, if I don't catch it first because it came up differently, I can't help that. That's just the way YouTube does things, okay? So now I thought of another number between one and 42. It was not the same number. I've written it down uh, and go between one and 42. Oh, somebody was so close. So close. So close the other side. Let's see who's going to get it. 
keep guessing. If you guess once, you can guess again. <laughs> nope, still don't see it yet. So close though, you guys are just like right there. Keep going. Nobody's got any yet. Take another guess. <coughs> Excuse me. I have not seen it pop up yet. Oh, there we go. James Lake. James Lake, you got it. Uh, 18, right there. See, I had written 42 the first time and changed it to 18. Oh, so you can see the little plan for our preservation room. Um, so James, contact me at thepurposefulpantry at gmail.com uh, and we'll talk about how to get this to you, okay? All right, so it's been an hour and 15 minutes. I'm surprised you guys hung around this long. If you want to stay, I can still answer some more questions for you. If you guys are ready to go, I won't feel bad to say, oh, nope. My Saturday's done. Let's go do some other things. Um, I've got a little extra time. So if you'd like to hang around, ask some more questions. You know, it's great. I am here for it. I am here for the dehydrating talk all the time. Just all the time. <coughs> mm, sorry. Man, talking in this much. JDB Fortney, uh, you're very welcome. Um, I'm here to, to share the knowledge that, you know, I've gleaned and shared with me to pass it on to you guys so that you can do the same thing by, you know, filling your pantries and then you passing on this information to other people too. I mean, this is like the more we teach the next, the next level, I don't want to say the next generation because even just, you know, in same generations, the more we spread this information, the more people can become more self-sufficient. I don't want to say that they don't need anybody else, but the more that they can do and the more that they can save, the less strain they are on society in general and the more they can help their neighbor. Um, because I'm really big on, I am not the kind of person who's saving all this for me. Um, if I can help somebody else with what I've stored, then I'm going to help somebody else with what I've stored. So the more we help, the more, the more it helps everybody else too. Okay. Uh, have fun at the, hey, tell him happy birthday, Brenda, and have fun at the party. Happy dehydrating to you too. All right, friends, it looks like nobody else has any kind of question. Um, so let's go ahead and just, uh, let's see, the best way to cut garlic to dehydrate. Mama Crypto, I throw it in my food processor and rough chop it. I don't even sit there and pick off the, like I'll take the excess papers off the outside, but I don't peel each of the cloves. I just throw them in the food processor, do a rough chop, throw them in my dehydrator and let it go because it's going to eventually mostly end up as powder anyway. And even then the pieces are small enough that if I want it in a meal, they're going to be fine. So I don't bother slicing. I don't bother sitting there trying to chop it up. I use it full clove, the whole thing. Um, will my kiwi ever be done? Sherry, give it time. It just takes a while. Um, there are master dehydrator classes, Peggy, from some extensions, not from all of them. They don't all offer it. Not all states do. And if in a state like mine, it's so large that the only place to get it is so far away, I would have to like go on a two week vacation and take the classes. Um, but it's it's not everybody offers them. You don't even get canning classes in all the extensions in all states anymore. It's just sad that that's that the the interest in preserving has gotten to the point where those are no longer um, offered everywhere. So check your area. You might have one. OK. Um, Let's see, I dehydrate marshmallows, store them in a bag. They got soft again, kind of dehydrated. You can always dehydrate them, Laura, but don't store them in the bag because bags aren't airtight. They're going to always be air permeable and moisture permeable, and it's just not going to be the best place for them. Um, um, Darla, um, about marshmallows, I saw you speak about peppermint ones for hot chocolate. What about others like candy? Um, do you mean... 
No, marshmallows can't be used for candy. You can use marshmallows again for Rice Krispie treats. They're not going to get like, you don't use them in place of the original marshmallows, but you can use them as an additive. Um, but um, marshmallows don't rehydrate back into something that you can use for other things. So I don't mean what you mean like candy. Oh, oh, but what, to eat them, yes. People will just like just sit there and, and munch on them because they're, they shatter in your mouth like, the ones that come in cocoa packets or like the cereal and they are just fun to eat. They're different textures. So they're, they, you can eat them like candy. Let's see. Casey, the thing about doing marshmallows is that when you test them, you have to give them about 15 minutes to, to cool off, then test it. The, don't turn, don't crank your AC down to 64 because you don't need to do that. That's that's a big electric bill. In Texas, that's a big electric bill. Just dry them and they're going to dry. You just need to give them time to cool off before you test. They're always going to be a little soft if you let them stay warm. If you're testing them too soon, they're going to always kind of be that way. Give them about 15 minutes to cool off then test it. If they're still not completely shattering in your mouth, they just need some more time. Okay. Um, 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 um. Let's see. Have I ever seen a recipe like rough greens for dogs? I don't even know what that is, Blue Moon. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know what that is. No, Mary, when you vacuum seal, you do nothing to the jar, but close it. Don't do anything else to it because anything that you do is going to affect being able to test whether or not that stuff is really not okay or, or, or because vacuum sealing a jar is not 100% vacuum sealed, like if you put an O2 absorber in there. So you're risking increasing the, the, the chance for mold formation or something else happening if you vacuum seal it. Just put it in the jar. Nothing else is done to it. Um, Dehydrating stale crackers? Yeah, do it. Just just like cereal, dry crackers, um, but any of those kind of dry food storage things that you do for snacking, they can go into the dehydrator to crisp them back up. Uh, Sharon, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Wow. The first, I think that's the first, no, it's not the first, well, that might be one of the very first ones I've ever had. Thanks. No, it's not, but close. I've forgotten the last time. That's really great. Uh, Darla Driver, do peeps? Yeah. If you go look on my website, you look on, if you go search in YouTube on my channel, I do peeps. We've done it. My, my family actually prefers them that dry instead of fresh. Okay, I think that we're going to go ahead and wrap this up for today. And I just so appreciate you guys all being here and contributing and telling me your stories and giving me your advice and, you know, helping other people when they have questions. If you give answers, I'm so appreciative that you do that. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you guys. It's uh, it's so cool that we have created this community on something so niche down as dehydrating. And there's so many of us doing it and so many of us learning how to do it. So I'm excited that you're here with me. So until I see you again next time, happy dehydrating. See ya. <laughs>